Hi, I'm Yvonne Sue Turner with Points of Light, and welcome to the fifth video in our corporate video lecture series. Today we'll hear from Cheryl Naja, who is the Director of Pro Bono and Community Service at Alston and Bird, an Atlanta-based law firm with a long history of giving back to the community. In fact, Alston and Bird was named to Fortune's 100 Best Companies to Work For list for 16 years. So Cheryl is going to tell us about why Alston and Bird is considered such a great place to work, specifically focusing on its culture of giving back through pro bono service. So Cheryl, tell us about how you do pro bono at Alston and Bird. Yvonne, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm delighted to be here and to have this opportunity to really share how uh, some of our best practices here at the firm and hopefully some ideas and best practices to encourage other companies to engage in pro bono work using their professionals to really have an impact on their community. I've got a PowerPoint that I've put together that I'm hoping to share um, that will support some of the things I'm going to talk about today. And let me get that pulled up. So I have to start by talking about our culture of commitment. Um, last year, uh, and I hate to dwell on numbers, but it really is a big number. Our firm contributed firm-wide 55,527 pro bono hours of legal service to our communities, both our local communities and around the world. Mm -hmm. So what is it that really drives this kind of commitment? Um, it's not just our law firm. It is the legal industry. It is lawyers. Um, it's built in. I, I firmly believe many lawyers go to law school to make a difference in the world. Um, it's what inspired them to go to law school. Once lawyers arrive at law school, and it has been a wonderful movement, something we've seen across the country, um, there typically have been public interest programs at law schools. Um, but we've seen an increase in the interest in pro bono and, and in more recent years we've actually seen certain states at the state bar level incorporate some pro bono requirements in order to become members of the bar new york being the first in the country um, it's been very inspiring to see that as the as lawyers across the country in the legal industry put more and more emphasis on using those legal skills to provide access to justice and provide legal services to those who need them most. And I'd like to take it further professionally. The ABA supports this. Um, it's pretty powerful that one of the model rules, rule 6.1, and I share this, um, every lawyer has that responsibility to provide legal services to those who are unable to pay. Um, and they set an aspirational goal for lawyers. Uh, they really suggest strongly that 50 hours of pro bono legal services per year should be attainable. Um, and the great thing about that is this rule goes on to emphasize the importance of providing those legal services to individuals of limited means without the expectation of pay, um, which is just a great way to kick off someone's career um, so I want to go a little more specifically about pro bono at Alston and Bird. We have an incredible uh, long history. Uh, our firm was actually established in 1893 and one of my favorite fun facts about the firm is that in 1924 one of our founding partners was actually one of 16 lawyers who helped form Atlanta Legal Aid. Um, that's to me, many, many years of an example, a living example, our legacy of how the firm has been focused on pro bono work. And so exactly what is pro bono at Alston and Bird as far as how we drive our program or structure things, we've got an incredible committee. Um, our committee right now has 83 members. It's represented um, with individuals throughout the firm in all of our locations, which really kind of helps us hear about local issues in certain communities, but it also brings together a lot of diverse thought of projects and things we can do. We focus and we have subcommittees that focus year round on programming and training, connecting with our community, and that's a very broad topic, let me tell you, but um, it's a good one. So that's everything from board leadership and where we can get it, leadership involved in nonprofits 
to how we are actually literally connecting with our community. We have a committee that focuses on celebrating pro bono. We had dedicated an entire week um, with events this year. We had 43 events firm-wide during that week of celebrating pro bono. Um, we established a very strong recognition program and recognition takes place all year. Um, we really want to recognize those individuals that are doing some extraordinary things. And then communication, how we communicate the stories both within the firm and outside the firm. This committee is really part of the strength behind um, our pro bono program, which really formalized in the mid 90s. Um, up until then, individuals did pro bono work, but in, I believe, 1994, we formed this committee and have grown it since then. So when it comes to doing pro bono, you're not just doing it on your own. How do you make sure your community partners are ready to become a part of your pro bono program? Um, this is where communication and building relationships and that connecting with the community committee becomes really important. Um, I, you know, I can have all the great ideas in the world, but I really have to have a relationship with a nonprofit to sit down and carve out projects um, that become part of your pro bono program. Um, it's a, a critical first step. Um, so it's really important to get out in the community, make sure you have great community partners, that you're talking with them regularly, that you're flushing out ideas, um, and you're not just having those ideas in the office uh, on your own and deciding to give them to somebody. Um, so it's very important work, but this is the communication and building relationships really is key. Uh, for us, you know, is there a secret sauce for making and matching projects to nonprofits? I want to talk a little bit about that uh, and really how we work. I want to start with, uh, I think, something that we say all the time. You know, we need your passion to intersect with your profession, but we need a lot of creative thought when it comes to program development. One of the things that we seek to do is to look for unmet needs. That to me is something that inspires me every day. There are lots of programs that are already established that people volunteer with and that's fine. But when we get ready to launch a new project, part of our process is really determining what things are not being done or is there an emerging need in the community that we need to consider and talk about is there a project or a way we could bring in some pro bono assistance to help. So you start by determining leadership. What is the leadership? The leadership is really identifying those key leaders who will help lead the project. It's great for me to have great ideas and it's great for the pro bono committee to have great ideas. But if you don't have those key leaders, the people who want to champion the cause and sustain the project, um, you really are going to develop something and the structure and the backbone is not there. The other thing I've learned over time is that it's great for me to, you know, send out an email or ask for help. But when other voices begin to appear to ask for help, it's not the same voice over and over and over again. And those champions really help drive the initiative and get more people involved. You do your due diligence. There's been a lot of lessons learned on my part of having these great ideas and talking to a nonprofit who maybe has needs and they're really excited about it, but I haven't gotten out in the community to find out, is there something else already happening? And I'm starting from the ground and developing a whole new thought and a whole new project and whole new processes when in fact we could collaborate with another organization or with other key stakeholders in the community and strengthen, fortify, and catapult something into a whole new realm. Um, so do that due diligence. I'll, I've got a great example of a project that we just launched in May. Um, we've been working with an organization out of New York, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. And they knew uh, with the work that they do, they run name change projects in a number of states. But in Georgia, they had a need, but they didn't have anyone managing the project in Georgia. So we raised our hand and said, yes, 
that was going to require us writing a, a handbook, developing the training for um, anyone who wants to volunteer with it. Georgia has 159 counties. The law changes in every county, so the process would change in every county. The first thing we did is sit down and talk with Lambda Legal, one of our partners here in the Atlanta uh, area, and ask them, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on this project? And we incorporated them in the planning of the process. Um, so it was a, it ended up being a much better launch. We're collaborating. We're able to take referrals from two organizations. Um, and it really made for a much smoother start. Set our goals. We set about with this particular project I was mentioning, um, we knew that it's a big project, but we did set our goals. And um, one of the goals that we set was start small. Um, we decided on three counties that we would launch the project in rather than trying to start with the entire state of Georgia it was too big. So the project is in its infancy. We've had five clients um, that we've been able to place. Um, we went a step further. We wanted to, one of our goals was to partner or with one of our clients. Um, so we've been able to partner with a client on this and we're working jointly, so it's fun. Um, you know, I'm always thinking of the business case. Is there a way that the business, what you do, can better support? And client partnering is one of the most fabulous things. And so that's been kind of fun along the way. We've piloted the project. Uh, do that. Piloting whenever you can prevents big mistakes. You know, we developed our process, but we did start small. We actually started with two clients and knew that those were our pilot pro processes, testing how we were doing things um, and making sure that we ironed out the kinks with those two to see if we needed to alter our process. Um, when you're managing pro bono projects, one of the things you do have to be mindful of is some of the administrative burdens that can come with it, who's managing intake, who's managing, you know, the keeping of the data, who's doing all of that. Um, and so starting small and having a chance to operate and making sure you've kind of got those processes set up is very helpful. Um, and then lastly, monitoring and measuring the process. And to me, this is the good stuff. You've really got to think about, you know, whatever stats or things you want to to gather, and I'll talk about that in a minute uh, on measurement, but the, this is where you develop the stories to share about your project, and it's so powerful. Um, you, you know, you want to measure the process, but you know, if it's a great project and something you want to sustain over a long period of time, making sure that you are developing a, a compelling story as you go because it sure does make it easier to grow the project and get more people involved. So I mentioned just gathering the data. I want to talk a little bit about thinking about that data as you start the process. Um, you have to think about this on the front end. How are you going to track those results? You know, will the hours be helpful, the number of volunteers or how many clients you're serving? Um, consider other pieces of data. One of the most powerful stories about gathering data and coming together periodically and discussing some of the data you've gathered can really take your project in a whole new direction. One of the best examples of this is some pro bono work that a lot of lawyers in the Atlanta community work on. It's through the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation, and they work a lot on housing issues for low-income individuals. And in tracking some of the data and in trying to keep people in their, in their homes um, where they were having some issues, they began to also hear a reoccurring problem with clients, and that was, you know, asthma and healthcare-related issues. And so coming together periodically and talking about those clients, it really emerged that some of the landlords in the communities where they were doing this legal work, it, there seemed to be a problem with filters. The internal air quality was problematic. And so by gathering data, coming together, talking about you know, their clients and the stories they'd heard and the asthma issues, kids missing school, the truancy, they were able to determine if they could get landlords to replace air filters 
for less than $10 and do it on a peri periodic basis, they were able to improve their client's air quality, all while we were just trying to take care of legal needs and make sure that you know some of the other landlord tenant issues were being addressed. It was a pretty powerful story and being able to keep kids in school when we were working on housing issues, pretty powerful. So I do say think about on the front end, the other thing about gathering data that we focus on quite a bit, a number of the nonprofits that we work with are able to use some of the data we gather um, and they use them for applying for grants. If you're establishing a new project and helping them meet needs in a community, community you really may have a, a, a huge way to help your nonprofit by making them eligible for grants they might not have known about. We also, on a regular basis, share our numbers with nonprofits because they just generally like to use those numbers and share the stories and the data out in the community. And it's really helpful that they have good collected data to be able to share. So as we moved along over the years, there have probably been some surprises, but maybe not. One thing I've learned is that um, people love volunteering when it's in their comfort zone. Um, and it just makes sense. They're better at doing the things they do professionally and do really well, and that they're experts in certain areas, and they love being able to share that expertise. Um, for some of our folks, if you were to ask them, do you want to volunteer and go you know, help, we're going to paint a school or, you know, we're going to do some landscaping projects. I mean, you absolutely get a shutdown. Over the years, when I began this project, um, I have a terrific example of something that I've been able to celebrate in the past couple of years. A number of our patent lawyers would say, you know, I'm ready to do pro bono work when you find me a really good patent project. And so I was always looking for a patent project um, and in the past couple of years, there's been a national initiative to launch patent projects across the country in all states, covering all regions, um, specifically to provide pro bono legal services to um, low income inventors. It was like a dream come true to have the opportunity to get to be able to launch patent projects, both in North Carolina, well, and a regional project that cover, covers the Carolinas. But this past spring, we launched uh, the Georgia Patent Project. And it's been so rewarding to be able to allow our patent lawyers to do what they do best, be a patent lawyer. Um, there are lots, of, I've spoken specifically about the way we engage our lawyers, but there are so many other examples of where um, some of the folks in our finance department have used their financial expertise to be able to assist nonprofits in analyzing data and reusing some of the data that they have to be able to apply for grants. Uh, our learning and development team members have worked with countless organizations in leading them in all sorts of trainings and running professional development programs and helping them launch their own professional development programs through trainings. And that's been incredibly powerful. Our event planning team and some of our conference services folks have worked to consult with nonprofits who really don't have that expertise and many times need advice navigating an area that is new and foreign to them. And our HR team, once a year, I have to say, our departments or sections of the department go out in the community and really work as experts to help nonprofits clients with all sorts of things, everything from a clinic on how to read your paycheck, our payroll team has led to some of the resume writing and some of the things in helping folks through, uh, definitely through interviews and other things. So it's been rewarding and I, I can't say it enough, um, Yvonne, as you get out and work with your professionals, there's nothing more rewarding than helping people find pro bono projects. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl, for that excellent presentation. Before we end the video, I do have a couple questions for you. I'm really relating back to that, that um, importance of skills-based volunteering and pro bono and having that be something that really resonates with young people. New research from the 2015 Millennial Impact Report shows that the first three years of an employee's life at a company are critical and it really sets the tone for how they're going to engage with causes during the tenure at their organization. So can you talk a little bit about how you integrate pro bono into the onboarding or recruiting process? Sure. Um, we have a very strong philosophy here that it getting involved starts the day you get started with the firm. We tell people from the day they begin, don't wait. Um, it's great if we have people join. We typically, especially with the lawyers, they join by a class, so they'll start in the fall, and we have a pretty intense um, training, a kickoff, and there we launch a full training series every fall and every spring. So there's opportunities to get in board, on board, learn about different projects, different needs, and um, we run these nationally and locally. So um, we have a lot of people that want to work on global related issues and we take advantage of that by doing those that way. If people join throughout the year, we do a one-on-one -on -one desk visit and talk to people about how they can plug in. Um, and so it really is so important to start as you begin. It's real easy to get involved in your career, get busy, develop certain work patterns and it's harder to back up and incorporate pro bono into your day-to-day. -day. But if you start with the mindset that I can work on something and dedicate two hours of every month, you can achieve that 50-hour goal, uh, the aspirational goal that we hope everyone will be able to do. Absolutely. Well, and, and to that point, I, the Financial Times actually recently reported that more than six million people on LinkedIn have raised their hands and said they're interested in lending their skills to nonprofit organizations for volunteering. But interestingly enough, uh, only 55,000 volunteer opportunities have been posted by nonprofits. And so I'm wondering, why do you think that is? What, what's really the cause behind that imbalance? I think sometimes with nonprofits, um, they're 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 smaller staffed and don't have ne the necessary resources to think through projects to be able to create those opportunities to post them. Um, so that's number one, um, and you know helping, and that's where I think each of us as professionals have that opportunity to do a little creative thinking, breaking down some of the tasks, looking for unmet needs. But the other thing I would say to volunteers is, or anyone who has an interest that's not seeing a post, but there's something they want to do, you know, be sure you make suggestions. We periodically will run, I say periodically, it's probably every three years. We try not to over survey people, but we will send out surveys of interest um, and we get great suggestions you know, to volunteer professionals, listen to that feedback because many times those new projects, people have, you know, will bring their experiences to you and talk about things they've seen. And if you listen to that, you can really help. And I, this goes back to having that relationship with nonprofits and really communicating well. It's so important because it's as volunteer professionals, your responsibility to go back and help that nonprofit develop those opportunities or those um, projects that in turn will serve the greater community. Great. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl, for joining us. And to our viewers, thank you, much, thank you very much for watching. For more information about corporate and employee volunteering, you can visit our website at www.pointsoflight.org and click the Four Companies tab at the top. Please stay tuned for our last video in our series where we'll focus on how you can manage a global volunteer program. Thanks so much. Thank you.